Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Hamish Downey, an English teacher and filmmaker who has been living in Japan since 2006. You might know me from such films as Matra and Vanilla or An American Piano. Today, I'm here to speak about why I love the films of the golden age of cinema. First, I'd like to talk about what the golden age of cinema is. Then I'd like to show what makes films of the golden age great by looking at perhaps the most famous film of the era in Japan, Roman Holiday. And then I'd like to explore the films of the golden age by using Roman Holiday as a starting point. So let's begin. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy listening to this as much as I enjoyed making it. The films of the golden age of cinema are the films of my childhood. This is thanks to them being the films that I grew up with, both on television as repeats and through the memories of my mother and grandmother, who experienced them at the time and as revivals in the 60s on television. My uncle was also an art director whose first job was doing the set decoration for Marlena Dietrichs's performance on Australian television. My parents were fairly conservative, so as a child of the 80s, I was allowed a small selection of films I could rent from the video store. They were Anne of Green Gables, The Never Ending Story, Big Business, Flight of the Navigator and Sunday Drive, which is where I first came across Carrie Fisher, who is the daughter of Debbie Reynolds, star of Singing in the Rain. Uh, my mum also let me watch any film in the classic cinema section at the local video store, which were mostly films of Humphrey Bogart, Marilyn Monroe, Audrey Hepburn and Catherine Hepburn. But what is the golden age of cinema, you might ask? The golden age of Hollywood was a period in American filmmaking in which the five major studios, MGM, Paramount, Fox, Warner Brothers and RKO, dominated the production and distribution of major motion pictures, or movies for short, controlling every aspect of a film's production, from casting to shooting to distribution. You might wonder why I haven't mentioned Walt Disney, but during this time, the films of Walt Disney were, were distributed by RKO. Uh, although there's some debate as to when the Golden Age began and ended, most critics agree that it existed in some form from the late 1910s to the early 1960s. Uh, over in England, my great great aunt, Annie Saker, who mostly worked in the theater, starred in one of England's earliest and now lost silent films, The Life Guardsman, in 1916. And I was to start making my first feature film in 2016. It took over four years from writing to finishing it, but it's an interesting thing that a hundred years apart, you know, my, my family were making films. Um, so, Anyway, this was a great era in film, the one where the language of cinema was purely visual and universal. A film made in any part of the world could travel anywhere and be enjoyed by all. However, all that ended with The Jazz Singer in 1927, the first sound film, sometimes called Talkies. Uh, the first line in a talkie was, you ain't heard nothing yet. <laughs> And basically, talkies became so popular that uh, very, very rarely do they make silent films today. Um, next came the pre-code era, which pushed the boundaries and gave us Marlena Dietrich and the films like Blue, The Blue Angel, Morocco, uh, which has influenced the work of Madonna and Takarazuka, and Shanghai Express. Due to its boundary pushing morales, there was an uproar, and in order to save itself from government regulation, Hollywood brought in the Hayes Code, which coincidentally also ushered in the most famous era of the Golden Age, the glitz and the glamour of the mid-1930s to the early 60s, which only slightly predated the end of the Hayes Code itself in 1968, which heralded the beginning of New Hollywood. Um, you might know New Hollywood with such films like um, 
the Godfather. Uh, the silent era, back to the silent era, from 1915 to 1929, and the pre-code era from 1929 to 1934, both existed as minor periods within the Golden Age. But when we think of the Golden Age of Hollywood, we tend to think of the glitz and the glamour that was popularised in the 1930s to the 1960s. So we're going to cut so we're going to cover that iconic era in further detail. But first, let's do a Golden Age of Hollywood definition. So uh, the Golden Age of Hollywood uh, has four major characteristics. One, star power. Two, the studio system. Three, propaganda, the Hayes Code. And four, emergent filmmaking devices. I'll touch on each of these elements when I talk about Roman Holiday. But for now, let's talk about the stars. The Golden Age relied on stars such as Humphrey Berger, Cary Grant, Grace Kelly and Rita Hayworth to carry its films to success at the box office. And uh, as Betty Davis once commented, uh, often one star would be in one film. They wouldn't very often do like uh, an all-star cast, like a... Uh, like a grand hotel or something like that. You know, that, that was more popularized later with the Agatha Christie mysteries. So um, not unlike the Japanese idols of today, the stars were under contract to the studio, but were sometimes loaned out to other studios if the project was good enough. MGM claimed to have more stars than, than there are in the hev <laughs> One more time. MGM claimed to have more stars than there are in heaven, but all the studios had big name actors and actresses. MGM had Judy Garland, Warner Brothers had Betty Davis and Humphrey Bogart, and 20th Century Fox had Marilyn Monroe, and so on. MGM in particular had a star making factory where they would change everything from how you looked, for example, plastic surgery, uh, such as Marilyn Monroe, uh, how you talked, such as Rock Hudson, even your name, such as Lucille Lesueur had her name changed to Joan Crawford by a contest in a magazine. This process was itself turned into the film A Star Is Born, which was remade four times, most recently in 2018 with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. So it, it's a pretty amazing story. So on to Roman Holiday. So let, let's take Roman Holiday through pre-production until release. So let's first start with pre-production. So while the film was released in 1953, the story of Roman Holiday starts six years earlier when it was originally optioned by Frank Capra in 1947. You might know Mr. Capra from his most famous film, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, which is a Christmas holiday staple on TV. He had originally planned to cast Cary Grant from North by Northwest and Shirley Temple, who you might know from Heidi, who was trying to transition into adult films, <laughs> who was trying to transition into more, uh, a more, mm, uh, and who had originally planned, okay, and Shirley Temple, who was trying to transition into, well, who was trying to transition out of a child star. And she had just started together with uh, Cary Grant in the film The Bachelor and the Bobby Sockster, which also starred Myrna Loy uh, from The Thin Man. Now, the plot of Roman Holiday is actually a variation on his Oscar-winning classic It Happened One Night from 1934, starring Clark Gable from Gone with the Wind and Claudette Colbert. Um, now, apparently, Betty Davis was up for this role, but she had to bow out because she broke her back, which is interesting because Claudette Colbert did the same thing with All About Eve um, nearly 15 years later. Um, so... The story is where an out-of-work reporter and a runaway socialite take a night bus together to New York, but they get stuck midway when the bus leaves without them. It's a really fun movie, 
and credited not only with inspiring the the romantic comedy genre in film, but also with inspiring Bugs Bunny. Okay, now, however, Capra's Liberty Films production company had money problems and he was forced to sell everything to Paramount. Now, as historians will know, this was around the beginning of the Cold War, the Red Scare, and the the, mm, and the House Un-American Activities Committee, where anyone considered to be communist sympathizers or associated with someone deemed to be a communist sympathizer could be compelled to the house and find themselves unemployable and friendless. And this is what happened to the original screenwriter of Roman Holiday, um, Dalton Trumbo, who was dubbed one of the Hollywood Ten. Capra, whose own work, including It's a Wonderful Life, had the house shark circling, so withdrew from the project. Enter William Wyler. He didn't mind working with Trombo Wyler, who was dubbed the woman's director as he had famously directed the Oscar-winning performances of Betty Davis and Jezebel, uh, Pseudo Gone with the Wind, set during the yellow fever pandemic, or epide- set during the yellow fever epidemic, and Greer Garson in Mrs. Miniver, Frederick March in The Best Years of Our Lives, Charlton Heston in Ben-Hur, and of course he would direct Audrey Hepburn to Oscar glory in Roman Holiday. So the original writer, Dalton Trumbo, was blacklisted as one of the legendary Hollywood Ten, and therefore could not receive credit for the screenplay, even when it won the Academy Award for Best Motion Picture Story. Instead, his friend Ian McClellan, Ian McClellan Hunter, one of the writers of the final screenplay, took credit for the original story and accepted the Oscar. Hunter did, however, pass on the $50,000 payment he received for the job onto Trombo. Trombo's wife, Cleo, was finally presented with the award in 1993, long after his death in 1976. The Oscar she received was actually a second one because Hunter's son wouldn't give up his father's Oscar. Thus, two awards for Best Motion Picture Story of 1953 exist. Uh, The story credit was corrected to credit Trumbo when the restored edition was released in 2002, nearly 50 years after the original release. After attending the world premiere of The Blue Lagoon, uh, not The Blue Lagoon that we all met uh, Brooke Shields in, but this is uh, The Blue Lagoon in 1949 in London, William Wyler at first wanted Gene Simmons to play Anne. Simmons had a similar look and an astro- had a similar um, Simmons had a similar look and aristocratic atmosphere to Hepburn, mixed in with a touch of Vivian Lee. She had a small but important role in the uh, Black Narcissus with Deborah Kerr, and modern audiences may know Simmons' voice as she would later voice uh, Grandma Sophie in the English dub of Hal's excuse me, in the English dub of Howl's Moving Castle, alongside fellow Golden Age star Lauren Bacall, wife of Humphrey Bogart. Uh, Wyler left the project after an agreement with J. Arthur Rank organisation could not be reached in time. Then he moved on to the heiress. Uh, After Wyler exited the project, George Stevens was brought in. Like many directors of the Golden Age, he had done everything from Swing Time with Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire to Giant and A Place in the Sun with Elizabeth Taylor, alongside the likes of James Dean, Rock Hudson and Montgomery Cliff. Uh, Stevens wanted to work with Taylor again, but after a deal with Paramount and MGM for Taylor's services was not reached, he declined to pursue the film. So as you can see, this is the issue with the studio system. While today actors are mostly freelance and can do, can take any film role offered, at this time if you wanted an actor not on contract with Studio A, then Studio B would need to loan said actor out for the film. This is one of the reasons why Betty Davis did not star in Gone with the Wind. David O'Selznick wanted her for the role, but Jack Warner wanted to package her 
with Errol Flynn, who was totally wrong for the part of Rhett Butler. So the whole thing fell apart. Betty Davis even left Hollywood for England and sued Warner Brothers for better parts as she felt she was being overlooked and being cast in junk. Uh, back to Roman Holiday though. Um, the property that was then, uh, back to Roman Holiday, the property was then offered to Wyler, who was coming off the back of two very weighty dramatic movies, The Heiress in 1949 and Detective Story in 1951, and was extremely glad to tackle a light romantic comedy, his first since the mid 1930s. However, once returning to the project, Wyler learned that Gene Simmons' contract with Rank had been sold to Howard Hughes' RKO Pictures. For more about him, please check out the great film The Aviator with Leonardo DiCaprio. So Wyler then tested just about every... Okay, and Howard Hughes wouldn't let her out of the contract. Wyler then tested just about every actress of note in Hollywood, but finally found his Princess Anne in the unknown Broadway actress, Audrey Hepburn. Hep Hepburn won the role of Anne thanks to a legendary screen test. She performed a scene from the film and the cameraman was instructed to keep the cameras rolling after the, cam after the director said cut. Several minutes of unrehearsed spontaneity of unrehearsed spontaneous Hepburn was captured on film. That combined with some candid interview footage won her the role. All right, now wander down here without your hands in your pockets and settle down in that chair and we'll make a nice close up of you. Chair it's the old day. Tell us about the war. You spent the whole war in Arnhem. Yes. Wasn't it pretty awful? Yes. It was very bad. But did you entertain the people there yourself? Is that how you began? No, not, not quite how I began. I went to ballet school once I knew I was settled there for quite a while. Didn't know how long the war was going to last, so I went to a ballet school and learned to dance. And in about 1944, about a year before the end of the war, I was quite capable of performing. It was a sort of some way in which I could make some contribution, and I did give performances to collect money for the underground, which always needed money. And what about the Germans? What did they do about it? There's no about it. So, um, as you can see from the screen test, Audrey Hepburn was a star. These days, audiences seem to want more ordinary people cast in movies so they can feel like that could be me up on the big screen. So we have the likes of Jennifer Lawrence, Seth Rogen and Amy Schumer ugh, as film stars now. Uh, we still have a few golden age style stars such as George Clooney, nephew of Rosemary Clooney of White Christmas, Will Smith and Har Halle Berry. But most Golden Age style actors like Jonathan Steech or Hunter Tyler just find themselves in horror films or soap operas these days, unfortunately. Uh, so Audrey Hepburn's casting conflicted with her appearance in the title role of the Broadway production of Gigi, for which author Colette personally had picked her. But modern sources note that William Wyler delayed production for six months to accommodate her schedule. This musical was then later turned into a film by Vincent Minnelli, father of Liza Minnelli of Cabaret and second husband of Judy Garland of The Wizard of Oz. See, everybody knows everybody. There's a small world in Hollywood. Uh, Paramount originally wanted to shoot this movie in Hollywood. William Wyler refused, insisting it must be shot on location, which at the time was pretty rare. Uh, they finally agreed, but with a much lower budget. This meant that the movie would be in black and white, not the expected Technicolor. And he would need to cast an unknown actress, the aforementioned Audrey Hepburn. The first American film to be made in its entirety the first American film to be made in its entirety in Italy. 
One of the reasons why William Wyler was anxious to film in Europe was because he wanted to put some distance between himself and the House Un-American Activities Committee, which was threatening to embroil him in the investigations because of his liberal stance. Paramount also had assets frozen in Italy and was delighted to take advantage of the opportunity to film in Rome and use some of that frozen money. Uh, so it worked out for everyone. Now, Gregory Peck's role was originally written with Cary Grant in mind. This isn't really unusual. He was the biggest male star of the time and one of the few freelance actors, meaning he didn't have to worry about his contract with the studio and being loaned out. Just about every script at the time was written for Cary Grant. Uh, every script that the great Billy Wilder wrote and was sent was sent out. Every script that the great Billy Wilder wrote was sent out and rejected by Cary Grant. The closest he got was the following year's Sabrina, which also starred Audrey Hepburn and likely rejected for the same reason as he rejected Roman Holiday. He believed he was too old to play Audrey Hepburn's love interest. He also turned down the lead in Billy Wilder's Love in the Afternoon in 1957 for the same reason. He did, however, play her on-screen love 10 years later in Charade in 1963, one of my favourite films and the best Hitchcockian film made that was not made by Hitchcock himself. Uh, Hepburn and Grant became firm friends working on the film and Grant considered her one of his favourite actresses to work with. Gregory Peck later said in life, at the time he felt like every romantic comedy script he had had the chance to read, had the fingerprints of Cary Grant on it, which as we know, it did. Uh, Gregory Peck was initially reluctant to take on a part that was clearly secondary to the young female lead, another reason why Grant is said to have reject rejected the role, until he realized that his image could do with some lightening up. At the time, he was known for his thrillers like Hitchcock's Spellbound with Ingrid Bergman of Casablanca, his biblical epics, which were very popular at the time, his war films, his issue films, such as Ella Kazan's fantastic Gentleman's Agreement, uh, where he plays a reporter who tells the world he's Jewish in order to cover a story on anti-Semitism and personally discovers the true depths of bigotry and hatred. So as you can see, why by the time he got the script for this film, Gregory Peck was hungry to do a comedy. He had not been in a comedy on film up till this point, and he jumped at the opportunity. Uh, so Paramount made an agreement with the British government and stipulated that there would be no mention made, that no mention made of a possible connection between the film and the British royal household, in particular Princess Margaret. A scene was shot for the sole purpose of establishing the princess was not British. So now onto the production. Some have said it was shot in black and white so that the characters wouldn't be upstaged by the romantic setting of Rome. And also because the black and white film stock was cheaper than color film stock and processing. I can attest to this as a former um, you know, film stock photography student. My goodness, they're expensive. Now, when Gregory Peck came to Italy to shoot the movie, he was privately depressed. He was privately depressed about his recent separation and imminent divorce from his first wife, uh, Greta. However, during the shoot, he met and fell in love with a French woman named Veronique uh, Pisani. Veronique Pisani. Following his divorce, he married her, she became Veronique Peck, and they remained together for the rest of his life. The Roman summer was stiflingly hot, with the temperatures in the high 90s, or, you know, the high 30s for us uh, outside of America. Crowds swarmed all over the locations, making huge impromptu audiences for the actors. Meanwhile, Italy itself was beset with clashes between political parties that resulted in strikes and unrest that threatened to disrupt production. Gregory Peck actually lost 16 pounds during the shoot because of the tremendous amount of work he gave and the fact that he only ate one sandwich during the day. 
my goodness, I guess that might be a way for me to lose weight. The country of which Anne is princess is actually never said. The introductory news flash lists a visit to London and Buckingham Palace as first on her tour of European capitals. There is also a reference to links with Western Europe, suggesting that Anne's own country is in Eastern Europe. Hmm. Uh, the embassy ball sequence featured in, actually, the embassy ball sequence in the beginning of the film featured real Italian nobility who all donated their salaries to charity. The reporters at the end of the film were real too. At the beginning of the movie, the elder gentleman dancing with the princess Anne says to her in Italian, I absolutely want to die on the ship. <laughs> Near the beginning of the film, the princess is in bed with a book about Alfred Hitchcock. Actually, Audrey Hepburn never got to make a film with Alfred. He uh, planned to make a film entitled No Bail for the Judge, starring Hepburn, who had long admired his work, but it was never made. In 1959, a Paramount publicity brochure titled Success in the 60s had touted No Bail for the Judge as an upcoming feature film starring Hepburn to be shot in Technicolor and Vista Vision. Fans of Hitchcock have called this project the most interesting of his cancelled projects. Obviously, this project was cancelled in order to film Psycho with Janet Leigh, Anthony Perkins and Vera Miles, and starting the modern horror slasher film, 20 years before Janet Leigh's own daughter, with some like it hot star Tony Curtis, Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween. So in a scene shot shortly after Anne and Joe meet, she quotes a line from a poem and they disagree about who wrote it, John Keats or, or Percy, I'm gonna mess this up, but Percy Bishy Shelley. Joe was right, by the way, the poem was by Shelley. Soon after, there is an important scene on the famous Spanish steps. Keats and Shelley both lived in Rome Keats in a house right at the bottom of the Spanish steps. The house is now a museum and Keats Shelley, the Keats Shelley house devoted to Keats and other romantic poets of the same era. You wouldn't see films today quoting poetry very often. Although, spoiler alert, my film Matron Vanilla quotes Japanese poetry. Uh, so Princess Anne, unrecognised by Joe, as well as doped and drowsy from uh, the doctor's sleeping drug, recites a poem. If I were dead and buried when I heard your voice beneath the sod, my heart of dust would still rejoice, which prompts Joe to declare her well read. The poem is actually an original work by Dalton Trombeau, the blacklisted writer. Hmm. So a little bit of self-congratulations in there, but it's a nice little poem. Um, so it was just chance timing that the film appeared at the moment when Princess Margaret was having to decide between love and duty. Apparently the script had been kicking around Hollywood for about 10 years with nobody backing it, which is kind of funny. Um, interestingly, the airplane carrying the royal family is an Italian, um, I'm gonna mess this up again, Brida Zapata BZ.308, which was designed for routes across Europe and across the Atlantic. First flown in 1949, this airplane was only three years old at the time of filming. Unfortunately, production was cancelled due to a shortage of orders. So the airplane in the film was the prototype. No others were ever built, interestingly. Uh, now on to post-production. With a budget of about 1.5 million and, oh, so I should really write this, put this later. So post-production. After filming, Gregory Peck informed the producers that as Audrey Hepburn was certainly going to win an Oscar for this, her first major role, they had better put her name above the title. They did and she did. 
During the documentary, A Conversation with Gregory Peck in the year 2000, Gregory Peck told the audience that watching Audrey Hepburn in her first starring film role in Roman Holiday was like watching a flower suddenly come to bloom and saying that she was born to play this princess. At the end of production, Paramount Studios presented Audrey Hepburn with her entire wardrobe from the film, including hats, shoes, handbags and jewellery. They were intended as wedding presents because soon after, but unfortunately soon after production, Hepburn ended her engagement to James, later Lord Hanson, a businessman that she met during the production, funnily enough. So both of the actors had met potentially their future, uh, well, one his future wife and the other one future, potentially her future husband. So Audrey Hepburn won the 1953 Best Actress Academy Award for Roman Holiday. This was after the film, which had a $1.5 million budget, had brought in $5 million at the box office. So a huge, huge hit. So on March 25th, 1954, she accepted the award from the much revered Academy President, Jean Herschelt. So Audrey Hepburn was so overwhelmed at winning an Oscar for the film that she took the wrong route to get to the stage, gave a breathless speech and left the trophy in the ladies' room. She and the Oscar were soon reunited, however, and lived happily ever after. <laughs> uh, and Audrey Hepburn was performing on Broadway in on Odi Odeon, on Dine, with her future husband, Mel Ferrer, when she won Best Actress for Roman Holiday. Later that year, she won the Tony Award for her performance in Ondine, making her one of only two actresses to win the Tony and the Oscar Award in the same year. Ellen Bernstein is the other, winning for Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore in, the, in 1974 and the Tony for Same Time Next Year. Uh, the Leeds tandem use of the Italian Vespa to stroke Scooter kindled an unprecedented public interest in the vehicle after the movie's release. Funnily enough, a lot of the film's success was attributed to the public's fascination with Britain's uh, Princess Margaret, who was creating a stir with her highly publicised relationship with commoner Peter Townsend. The princess was forced to renounce her true love because he was divorced and marry him more suitably uh, and someone of her own class. Uh, but apparently he still was and remained the love of her life. In the 1970s, both Gregory Peck and Audrey Hepburn were approached with the idea of a sequel, but the project never came to fruition, unfortunately. But perhaps it's for the best because sometimes sequels aren't quite as good. Uh, uh, so in addition to a paramount contract and instant stardom in America and Europe, Audrey Hepburn gained a major celebrity in Japan due to her role in the film. Her hairdo was copied by many young Japanese women. In October 1991, the Writers Guild of American West, acting on the recommendations of its ad hoc blacklist credits committee, officially credited Trombo with the film's story and awarded him with the same Guild screenplay prize that Hunter and co-screenwriter John, um, John Dieton shared in 1954. Although he refused to attend the ceremony, Hunter also won an Academy Award for Best Writing Motion Picture Story, which AMPAS restored to Trombo posthumously in 1993. William Wyler's longtime collaborator Lester Cogning went to Rome to work on the script but also did not receive credit because of blacklisting. So as you can see this is one of the big features of um, unfortunately of the golden age is this um, the, the propaganda of the era. Um, so included in the, um, the film is included in the American Film Institute's uh, 2002 list of the top 100 
greatest American love story movies included among the same AFI Institute's 2000 list of the 500 movies nominated for the top 100 funniest American movies and in June 2008 it was ranked number four on the same AFI Institute's list of 10 greatest films in the genre romantic comedy and just recently played again on Japanese TV. Roman Holiday is undeniably a classic film. So to sum up, I like the golden age of cinema because I grew up watching these films. So that's what cinema is to me. I have a personal connection to the golden age because it represents the youth of my grandparents and watching Betty Davis and uh, Audrey Hepburn feels like I'm spending time with my grandmother. Uh, I like these films because the actors and the actresses were truly stars. It was not about trying to be the boy or the girl next door like today, where every actor is named Chris and actresses post photos on social media of their ordinary lives and pets. The message of today seems to be, we could be anyone, therefore you too could be a star. The message of the golden age was that these stars were mythical gods. A lot of bad came with that, but there were some really good films. It's a shame that many non-white stars weren't given the roles they deserved, uh, like Dorothy Dandridge, Eartha Kitt, Niyoshi Umeki and Anna Mae Wong. They all deserved more. It's not perfect, but there are some great films like Roman Holiday that are worth exploring. Today, films are mostly made for 13 year old boys, whereas in the golden age, except for animation and some cowboy flicks, films were made for adults. The rules were strict, so the stories and the scripts had to be smart. That's why we have films like Bringing Up Baby, His Girl Friday, All About Eve and The Women, where the dialogue is so quick and clever. Uh, great stories told by great actors and smart directors and wearing beautiful costumes. This is why I like the golden age of cinema. Thank you so much.